of those who are able, uh, if you would please stand for the first scripture reading from Luke 3:21 to 23a, 4, 1 to 2, 14, 15. <clears throat> Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing at all during these days, and when they were over, he was famished. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. You may be seated. Let the people say amen. amen. Turn me up just a little bit more, Drake, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Today I'm going to, not that quite that large. Down just a little bit, right there. Today I'm going to uh, continue in this series of sermons that uh, I began last week, talking about transitions that we experience and find ourselves in the midst of life. Last week I talked about how endings come, whether we are expecting it or planning for it or not. An ending comes, a change happens, and we find ourselves no longer in the world we used to live in and how it's important to validate those endings and those changes to, to give ourselves permission to, to express that there's been loss and we have grief. This week I want to talk about that middle zone, that transition that we find ourselves in between those two different worlds, the one that no longer exists, and the new hope that hasn't yet come about uh, for us or for others. And then next week I'll talk about the new beginnings that might uh, bring forth in us and in the world around us. Now, the reality is that we don't work through these things one right after another. Sometimes we're already in a new situation, and, and yet our emotions haven't caught up with us. We're still grieving some change that has happened in our past. Or other times, maybe we, we haven't yet come to a place of ending, but, but we already feel like we're out in the middle of the wilderness and are trying to make our way. So as we go through this series of sermons today, I um, invite you to think about a, a transition in your life, something that you're reflecting upon, a loss that has happened, a, a way that you might be feeling like you're in a wilderness time. Our scripture text, the second one I want to read for us today, comes from 1 Kings chapter 19. And it's about the story, part of the story of one of the prophets of our Old Testament, Elijah. Elijah's done a lot of different ministries um, up to this point in time. And then, because his life is threatened, he's running for his safety. And I, I wonder if he's also running to be a part of a time of transition in the midst of his life. And how his life will be changed through this journey and who he will become, which will be different when he returns. I invite you to listen for a word of God for your life as I read. Ahab, Ahab's the king, and his wife is Jezebel. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how he killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like the life of one of them, by this time tomorrow, if I don't execute uh, getting rid of you. Then Elijah was afraid, and he got up, and he fled for his life, and came to Beersheba, down to the south, uh, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. He asked that he might die. It is enough. Oh, now, O oh Lord, take my life away. For I am no better than my ancestors, 
And he lay down under the broom tree and fell asleep. And suddenly an angel touched him and said, Get up and eat. And he looked, and there at his head was a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came a second time, touched him, and said, Get up and eat. Otherwise the journey will be too much for you. He got up and ate and drank and then he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. At that place he came to a cave and spent the night there. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. And they are seeking my life to take it away. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind, so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks into pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of sheer silence. Then Elijah heard it. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Then there came a voice to him that said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Same, same statement. And he answered, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're seeking my life to take it away. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Also you shall anoint Yahu, son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha as prophet in your place. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. A change happens and a loss comes about, and all of a sudden we find ourselves out in the wilderness. The old life, the old world doesn't exist anymore, and, and we're out in the middle of this transition space trying to make sense of who we are. And we don't like going in those transitional places. They're scary. We have tremendous fears. There's this feeling of emptiness, and yet we find ourselves out there in the middle, and it's a messy middle. We are people who would like to move from one place to the next. Uh, Shelly and I just moved from a place in Kansas here. And, you know, we, we want to move to this town and, and be settled. We want it all, all fit just perfect and, and to be done with the transition. Uh, you can maybe think of other transitions in your life. We, we, we want it to go quick and fast. We want it to be painless as we move from one place, one situation, one relationship, one context, whatever it is, to the next. We live in a world that's very mechanical. And so sometimes we project onto our lives that our lives can be just as mechanical from moving from one thing to the next, almost like, uh, almost like a switch that we can turn and we can all of a sudden be in that new situation, that new place in our lives. We'd like it that way. But that's not the world we live in. That's not who God has created us to be as persons. I read the scripture text today with a tablet, right? Uh, th this tablet, every once in a while, it'll, it'll, it'll have a little uh, a, a deal to tell me that I need to update the operating system. Or I'll have an app, application on it, and it'll say, you need to get this updated in some fashion. And it's real simple and painless. I just push a button, and it does it all. And it does it real fast. We, we'd like our lives to be that way. Where we go from one situation to the next without pain, without grief. And we want it to be done quickly. And, and, and there's not a place that you and I can go. We, we can't go to a, a, a physician of some sort. We can't go home. We can't go somewhere else and go in as one person and come out as 
someone else, Dustin 2.0 or, or whatever. Our transitions don't happen like that. Our transitions are, are more of a process. It's a journey that we're on. Uh, we're more organic than our mechanical kind of world. It's, a, it's more of a process where we go through a time of, of um, dormancy or a time of laying fallow. I, I like that idea of laying fallow for a time. Maybe it's a term you're, you have heard before. I grew up in western Kansas where there is very little rain comparatively to here in northeast Nebraska, and it's dry. And so because of the absence of moisture, our fields lay fallow. There, there's no crop put into the fields every other year. We, we never have continuous crops put into our fields because the, the field can't sustain it. It's too much. And so we'll have a crop and then the next year we'll let it lay fallow. And it's really this time where the, the soil can be uh, regenerated, can be nourished, the moisture can be soaked up and, and the soil can be prepared for new life that will happen thereafter. And in a lot of ways, I think that's what happens in our lives when we go through transitions. We find ourselves in the middle of a wilderness time and it's a gift for us to lay fallow for a time and reassess who are we and what, what, what's our life all about and to prepare ourselves. And yet it's hard work. It's hard work to, to make that journey in the midst of the wilderness. In our biblical stories, we find uh, lots of different places where people make journeys. There's the people of Israel who make a journey themselves. Uh, maybe it's one of the bigger stories that we find in our Old Testaments. They, they're journeying from being slaves in Egypt to being the people who are, are God's covenant people who come into the land that was promised to them and to their foreparents. But, but if you know the story, they, it takes them 40 years to make that transition out in the wilderness, the desert. They really have to unlearn who they have been before and, and learn how to depend upon God and learn how to be bound together with one another so that when they come into that land, they are a new people. They have to die to them old selves so that they can be raised to new existence, a new life, a new beginning. Our scripture text, the one from 1 Kings talking about Elijah, I'd never heard of it or thought about it this way, but in some sense, maybe this is one of those times in Elijah's life where he is making a similar kind of transition where he's been doing all these different ministries. He's been speaking out against the different prophets of Baal or Baal, however you want to say it. There's even been a time of, of drought and he's prayed over and over again that the, the heavens would open up and water the thirsty land. And he's been doing all this and, and now his life is threatened and, and maybe he's running off, um, running off to this mountain of God in the middle of the desert because he's not sure what his work is to be about anymore. He even wonders if he could die because it's not working. Sometimes that's how we feel when we're in the middle of the wilderness. It's not working. I don't know where I'm going. I'm overwhelmed. God just end it all and, and make it easy. But, but God often doesn't do that. Comes alongside of us, rather. Reveals God's self to us, rather, like with Elijah. Elijah's going to be called here to come back and begin his ministry afresh. And, and actually to change his ministry such that he finds a, a mentee that he's going to care and cultivate and he's actually going to give his mantle to that person to carry on that ministry, Elisha. There are times in our lives where we, we've been the one doing it all before and then we have to transition to helping someone else to come alongside and do something new. And it's a transition. Or we think about Jesus' story. <clears throat> that we, we heard at the very beginning of his ministry. He's, he's 30 years old, and for much of his time, he's been Joseph's son there in Nazareth. And I'm just struck that he doesn't come to the Jordan River and be baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River and then go begin his ministry. He doesn't do that. He, he doesn't go back up to the Sea of Galilee and start calling his disciples and begin his ministry. Rather, he is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. 
I, we often focus on the part about him being tempted and tested. But there's other aspects of He's it. there in the wilderness so that he might let go of who he had been before and might claim his identity as son of God, of savior, of good shepherd for the world and the work that he has to go. Maybe it's that time of, of fallow so that he might be most able to make a difference in the world around us. As you think about your life, your journeys, your transitions, my invitation is that we might be intentional to create that space where we can be still, we can know that God is God, where, where we can journey in that wilderness time and be renewed so that when the time comes and seeds are planted within us, we get to spring forth new life. But we have to be intentional to do that. We, it just doesn't happen for us. And I think that's the case for us as individuals. That's the case for us as families. Even as a congregation in the midst of change and transition, maybe part of our work that we're called to do now is to just, to, just pray. God, what's the next thing you have for us as a congregation? How can we not fill our lives with busyness so we don't have to feel the pain of transitions? and dwell in the midst of the wilderness time. Last week I introduced a book uh, by William Bridges, <clears throat> Managing Transitions. I encourage you, if you would like to learn more, to consider this book as one of them to, to engage. And he talks about the, this, this middle zone, this messy middle, this wilderness time is, is a time we don't want to spend a long time in, but, but we need to. And yet it can be life-giving for us. When the whole pasts of our lives have fallen apart, it's in this wilderness time that we prepare ourselves for new life and new beginning that God might be calling us. He actually says there are four things that we can do when we're walking in the wilderness. And maybe you're walking it now or maybe we'll be in some time in the future. And, and the first thing is to surrender. Is to surrender. We, we don't like surrender. We like to be in control. And we like to have the way we want it. But when an ending comes and the life that we used to live that we still want is no longer there, there's not much we can do about it. But we'd like to go back and sometimes we try to live like we still are back there. And that doesn't usually work for us. Almost all the things we can do is is surrender, is to release, is to, to let go. And, and for me, that, that's kind of scary because I don't know if I'm going to like what the future is. At least I knew what the old past was like before. The people of Israel, uh, when they come out of being slaves in Egypt, <clears throat> they, they get just out into the wilderness just a few days, and, and maybe you remember the story, all of a sudden they start complaining to Moses and to God. They, they keep saying, if only we were back in Egypt, at least there we knew the routines, and at least there we had our food as we had expected. They forget that they had been slaves and had been abused and they had their freedom, we often are looking back. To, to not do that, we have to let go. We have to surrender ourselves. The other thing we do is we're called to be still. We're called to be still and, and not keep trying to do all the stuff that we do. To, we sometimes go about our day, we have the radio on, we've got the TV on, we've got uh, phone calls going on, we've got our gadget, and we're texting, and we're talking, and we're checking Facebook and everything else. And maybe what we need to do is be still. You can maybe read the word under there. It says breathe. The smaller words say be still and know that I am God. Sometimes we surrender, we let go, and we say, God, I can't take this. Be with me. Help me to learn the lesson I can learn today. Help me to to know that you're there with me no matter what. Be still and know that I am God. The third thing that we can do is that we can reflect, we can think about our lives and reflect upon who we have been. Sometimes when we're in that middle of the wilderness and that transition time, we can look back to 
Other times when we have been in transition, other times when we have lost things and, and how we responded in those places. Maybe it's that time where we look back and we see things that used to excite us and jazz us that we've let go of, or we've looked at different things that have made important markers in our life journey, and, and the hope is that we can get a glimpse of who we're called to be now in, and in our next steps. And we're afforded that when we're in the wilderness, to have that time of reflection. The last thing we're called to do is to get more clear about what we really want. Sometimes we don't know what we really want. I mean, even, even when we're little, we're told, you know, are you sure you want that? You don't want that. I know better, better than you do. You want this. And we, we grow up not really knowing what we want. Sometimes we learn to want what someone else wants for us, a parent or a teacher or someone else, and, and we don't know what we really want. And when we find ourselves in the midst of a change and a transition and everything has come crashing down, we can have that space to figure out what's really most important. Maybe we're thinking about the, the, the future uh, career for our life, or, or maybe we're thinking about what, what we want to do in the next five years. There, we're all at different places in our journey, right? What do you want to do with the days that you have left to make a difference in the world? What's the next thing you want to make a difference in your family, your business, your community, your school, our church? When we find ourselves in that wilderness time, we're, we're invited to make the most of it. Not to run ahead or to live in the old world, but to be present here and to know that God is with us. And the, my expectation is that as we do that, uh, slowly, we, we want it to be faster, but slowly we'll, we'll become that fertile soil from which new life that God will place within us will spring forth and bring fruit, fruit worthy of the kingdom. And God will be glorified. And we'll become new people and we'll see a glimmer of a new beginning that is just on the horizon. Uh, the last picture I want you to see this is a picture from the top of Mount Horeb where Elijah went, where Moses came to gather and receive the Ten Commandments from God when the people of Israel are, are in the wilderness. And, and it's looking to the east, and it's the sun just coming over the horizon. It's the first light. Uh, my hope is that we're walking in this wilderness time if we're willing to let ourselves be still and know that God is God. Reassess who we are and what's most important to us. What are our values that are shaping our lives? And, and pray. God will start giving us a glimmer, a first light of what's possible, of resurrection, of new beginning, of what's possible for our lives. We may have to release control, but we might gain the whole world that God wants to give us. Will you please pray with me? Gracious God, we ask that you might journey with us. We're all in different places. Change is hard and transition is hard and, and yet it seems to happen over and over again. Help us to lay fallow. And God, as we're on this journey, feed us, just like you fed Elijah. Feed us for the journey ahead. Make yourself known to us challenge us, help us to be made new, your disciples who share the good news of Christ with our actions, with our words. Help us to be a part of a new beginning you want to see in us and in the world around us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.